Hello and welcome to Africa, the road to and through democracy. My name is Matthew Hughes and I serve as the executive director of the International Relations Council in Kansas City. And we're so glad to have you with us today. The International Relations Council strengthens Kansas City's global perspective by maintaining an active dialogue around world events, global issues, and their impact on our community. As a nonpartisan educational nonprofit organization, the IRC values informed civil discourse, accessibility, and substance as we work to sharpen our community's 21st century global acumen. Whether you are joining us as part of our live audience this evening or viewing this recording later, we invite you to learn more about the International Relations Council, including other upcoming events and how to join the IRC as a member on our website at irckc.org. Sub-Saharan Africa is home to nations on the full spectrum of democratic development, from authoritarian and semi-authoritarian regimes that have begun to embrace democratic principles to established states that consistently hold free and fair elections, reconcile internal differences, and contribute meaningfully to the larger international community. This evening's program will critically examine the challenges particular to the African continent in the establishment, growth, and maintenance of democracy. Our esteemed guest speaker and moderator will help us explore the paths, including obstacles and successes that various countries have taken and what realistic prospects are for the flourishing of African democracies going forward. We hope you'll engage with us this evening as we explore democracy and democracies in Africa. We welcome your thoughtful questions through the course of the conversation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator for today's program, who will introduce our speaker and help us navigate the conversation. In addition to being a member of the IRC Board of Directors, Dr. Karen Beth Zacharias is Chair of the Division of Humanities and Liberal Arts and Director of the Lawrence D. Starr Center for Peace and Justice at the University of St. Mary. Her passion for human rights began when she lived in Turkey as an American field service student after high school graduation. Expanding her understanding of international laws around protections of vulnerable populations, Karen Beth teaches courses on the history of genocide, women in world history, and modern Africa. Karen Beth has a JD from the University of Kansas School of Law and a PhD in history from KU. She's also vice president of the United Nations Association of Greater Kansas City. Karen Beth, thanks so much for joining us tonight. We look forward to the program. Please take it away. Thank you, Matthew. And um, I'm so looking forward to this evening. It is my great pleasure to introduce now Dr. Christopher Formonio. He is the Senior Associate and Regional Director for Central and Western Africa for the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs in Washington, DC. In that role, he has done things like election observations in a vast number of countries, including Benin, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Cote d'Ivoire, Ethiopia, Ghana, Liberia, Madagascar, Mali, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria. In addition, he has worked to supervise democratic support programs in countries such as Burundi, Burkina Faso, Rwanda, Togo, Democratic Republic of Congo. And he has designed and helped launch the African Statesman Initiative, which is a program aimed at facilitating political transition in Africa. Um, he holds a law degree from Yonda University in Cameroon. He has an LLM in international law from Harvard and a PhD in political science from Boston University. It is with great pleasure we welcome you and to hear about Africa, the road to and through democracy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zacharias, for that wonderful introduction and also, Matthias, for your warm welcome. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be here. And you know, when I got the invitation and saw the pedigree of um, distinguished speakers that have gone through uh, the International Relations Council in Kansas City, uh, I really felt a sense of pride and honor uh, to be invited. And I'm so delighted 
that the council has stayed focused on its global interest at the time uh, when many similar organizations are more inward looking. Uh, because as we've learned in recent history, events that happen on other continents and in other countries invariably in this day of a global village uh, impact either positively or negatively on the United States. Uh, we all are now dealing with uh, COVID-19 and its impact, and we all know that it started on foreign shores. Uh, we all as Africans or Africanists and friends of Africa remember the bombings in US embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998, uh, and then the aftermath of 9-11. So I'm delighted that despite the challenges that uh, may be faced on the domestic scene, that the council has remained very focused on the global scene and finds plat provides platforms such as this one uh, to engage us in meaningful conversations about developments on other places and particularly this evening, developments on the African continent. As you all know, Africa is a continent of 54 countries with a lot of diversity in their history, their cultural backgrounds, their political, the pace of political developments and where they find themselves on that trajectory of democratic governance, as Matthew explained at the beginning, uh, that we now have a, a, a mix of countries. Some are still grappling with issues of authoritarianism and military rule. Others are part, partly free because they've engaged in the process of democratic transitions, but haven't quite succeeded in consolidating the gains of recent years. And others, thankfully, are now being considered even by internationally reputed organizations such as Freedom House as either totally free or partly free. And I thought that for this evening's conversation, I would start off by using a case, one of the African countries as a case study and give you a brief summary that captures or encapsulates what the challenges are that we face on the African continent as well as what opportunities lie ahead. And the one country that came to mind for me is the country of Nigeria, which is Africa's highest populated country with a population of well over 200 million inhabitants, 70% of whom are 30 years or younger, a country that obtained its independence from Britain as the colonial power in October of 1961, and that for the first five years functioned as, as a democracy with vibrant political parties and civil society and labor unions, but that began experienced its first military takeover in 1965. And between 1965 and 1998, the military controlled the politics of Nigeria for the most part, uh, except for a few intermittent years of civilian rule. But it was in 1998, 1999, that Nigeria made its transition from military rule to civilian democratic rule through elections that were seen as credible and accepted by all parties. And for the past 20 years, 21 years, it's worth celebrating that Nigeria has continued to function as a democratic society. Nigeria's experience on that trajectory reached a high watermark in 2015, when for the first time in Nigerian history, a sitting president democratically elected, lost a presidential election and accepted the outcome, called up his opposition and congratulated him. And for the first time in Nigerian history, facilitated a transition from a democratically elected president to another democratically elected president in the person of current President Muhammadu Buhari. Unfortunately, in the past few days, Nigeria has been embroiled in a crisis, which I think also captures the, the conflict of trends that we now see on the African continent between what I would call authoritarian opportunism and democratic re resilience. Today in Nigeria, 175 citizens representing political parties and civil society organizations filed a lawsuit 
before a regional court of the Economic Community of West African States, the ECOWAS Regional Court, to ask for an injunction to lift the ban on Twitter that has been imposed on the country of Nigeria by its president since last Friday. The battle between the Nigerian government and Twitter has been going on behind the scenes for a couple of weeks, ever since Twitter decided that it was going to move its capital from Nigeria that everyone had thought would be because it's the most attractive country by its size for foreign investors, that Twitter decided to move its headquarters for African operations from Nigeria and locate that head office in Ghana. It made the decision to locate its headquarters in neighboring Ghana, which is seen by many Africans and many students of African politics as one of the few countries that is doing extremely well, both in terms of economic development and political development. Ghana is being seen as one of those countries that has continuously and regularly had peaceful and meaningful elections that have contributed in some cases to an alternation of power between parties in opposition and ruling parties in a way that is accepted by the vast majority of Ghanaians. Its growth rates, especially prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, have also been on the positive trajectory and it continues to attract foreign investors, including many um, nationals of African descent, including Americans of African descent, many of whom have now re relocated to Ghana because of the facilitation that Ghana provides to people of the African descent. I should also remark that last Wednesday, before the ban was put in place, the president of Nigeria wrote a tweet, posted a tweet, which Twitter brought down because Twitter felt that this tweet was inciting violence, especially given the restiveness that is felt in parts of Nigeria, notably the southeastern part of Nigeria that has been threatening to secede since the civil war that the country experienced between 1967 and 1970. And so when the president issued his ban on Friday, it caught a lot of Nigerians by surprise. But many Nigerians also remember that in 2020, the country had gone through a crisis where millions of young Nigerians took to the streets to protest against police violence. That protest took on the hashtag on Twitter of NSARS, which was N the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, which is a, a squad of the Nigerian police noted for acts of violence on civilian population. The government was caught off guard because of the level of mobilization that young people were able to achieve using social media to get people into the streets. And the fact that after the demonstrations, these young people transformed, sought to transform the NSAS movement into a movement that would advocate for good and accountable governance. Unfortunately, during those demonstrations, people were killed. And by official accounts, close to 80 Nigerians lost their lives. But that movement also triggered a constitutional re um, uh, amendment process, reform process, and consultations initiated by the federal government of Nigeria to create platforms where they could listen to citizens and get their grievances to be integrated into policy formulation. I would leave it there by way of a synopsis on the Nigerian situation, but I hope that the points that I've laid out would now allow me to identify for you all what challenges the continent faces in terms of consolidating democratic governance. First, the, the first challenge that we see across the continent, reflected to some extent in the Nigerian story, is the, the, the continuous recalcitrance of autocratic trends. The fact that in a number of countries, 
Even leaders who came into power through the democratic process have been working to shrink political space even further and to limit the liberties and civil rights, civic rights of their citizens. That in some countries we see the military rule, and in the last few months, we've seen coup d'etats in Chad and in Mali. And that even when uh, um, civilian candidates or political leaders have been elected into office, some of them have put in place laws and regulations that make it extremely difficult for democracy to survive on the continent. The second challenge that I see on the continent is the challenge of exclusion. The fact that in far too many African countries, we are still unable to find genuine opportunities to include youth and women into policy formulation and into political leadership position. For all of its many years of existence and governance, Africa has not known many women leaders. President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia was the first woman to be elected president of an African country when she got elected in 2007 and served first a six year term and then was re-elected in 2013 to serve another six years. Fortunately, we had two other women elected, um, um, two other women presidents who didn't come through elections, but because they were in positions as vice presidents in their respective countries, when the sitting presidents passed away, they then moved into the position of president. And in the case of Malawi, Joyce Banda was able to govern the country for about three years before elections. And most recently in Tanzania with the passing of the Tanzanian president, we now have Dr. Semer, who is the president of Tanzania and who is trying to shepherd that important African country on the eastern coast of the continent onto the democratic path. I also see a lot of challenges in terms of constitutionalism and the rule of law, that in many African countries, the rule of law doesn't really prevail, that the constitutions are weak, and the laws that govern opportunities for citizen engagement in politics are often tempered with or tinkered with by incumbent regimes to strengthen their power and in many cases to perpetuate themselves in office. Prior to 1990, there were only four African presidents who had relinquished power voluntarily and who were still living or still alive on the continent. With the political transitions that we saw in the early 90s around what political scientists have called the third wave of democratization, we now have over 40 individuals who have served in state houses and who have relinquished power either because they lost elections and accepted the outcome or because they were term limited. Unfortunately, in the last several years, in the last four to five years, we've seen a very negative trend where sitting presidents have amended the constitutions of their countries to perpetuate themselves in power. And there is a genuine fear out there amongst African Democrats that the continent may be reverting to the years of presidents for life or one strongman rule for decades. We now have presidents in Africa that have been in power for 40, two years, for example, the president of Equatorial Guinea that has been in power for 42 years, President Paul Bia of Cameroon, who has been in power for 38 years, President Denis Sassou Nguesu of Congo, Brazzaville, who has been in power for over 35 years, same with President Museveni of Uganda. And this is a very negative trend, which continues to impede the consolidation of democratic gains on the African continent. The last two challenges that I will talk about, and I'll do this very briefly to allow the opportunity for questions and answers, are the challenges of insecurity, which sometimes is uh, internally driven because of the unprofessionalism of security services or the fact that security services allow themselves to be instrumentalized 
for partisan political gain, for example, in inhibiting, inhibiting the ability of opposition candidates and parties to campaign around elections, as well as external sources of, uh, of insecurity that we now see, for example, in the Sahel region or in the Horn of Africa with violent extremist movements that have come from or come or been driven or started in other shores around the Middle East and have now found themselves on the African continent and are causing havoc in a number of countries, some of which were fledging emerging democracies, but that have now been crippled by shifting their resources and investing in the fight against terrorism as opposed to investing in the social sector. The last impediment that I see to democratic consolidation on the African continent is the influence of illiberal actors, illiberal external actors or illiberal influences. And in this regard, I'm talking about the role of China and Russia, that nobody can forbid these countries for us, from also taking opportunities to invest on the African continent or to do business with African countries. But what worries African Democrats is the, the, the narrative that these superpowers put forward that tell some of the African leaders that you can have development without democracy. And that you only have to look at their example of how they have been able to accomplish some level of development even without being democratic. And that in a number of African countries has undercut the enthusiasm that we saw for democratic governance, the effervescence and the huge volume of citizen engagement in politics and in democratic uh, governance that we saw in the early 90s. You wouldn't be surprised to hear that as the Nigerian government got into its battle with Twitter, it also turned to requests from the Chinese assistance in building a platform that could allow it to bypass Twitter, but sadly enough, a platform that would also allow or strengthen the government's hand to spy and uh, impose surveillance on its own citizens. That said, one must also recognize that the continent of Africa has got tremendous opportunity. It is the youngest continent on the surface of the earth, it's got a youth board with most of the continent being 18 years and younger. It also has a potential market of 1.4 billion inhabitants. Africa, it's got a very dynamic diaspora, which is, remains very connected to the continent and which continues to influence positively developments on the African continent. You wouldn't be surprised to hear, for example, that Nigeria has got 400,000 members of the Nigerian diaspora that are resident in the United States and that are professional. And that by a study that was conducted by, jointly conducted by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Aspen Institute is one of the most educated diasporas, if not the most educated diasporas in the United States. We also see a lot of value in the dynamism of African women and the roles that they continue to play. And you may remember that in recent times, in a country such as Sudan, that had been under military rule for well over 30 years, that it was through the organizational skills of women and civic leaders that the former military ruler of Sudan was able to be, was forced out of power and relinquished power because of the approach that was taking, taken by these women professionals who led the struggle to bring about a, trans, a peaceful transition and meaningful change in Sudan. African women are becoming more outspoken in asking for a role for themselves. And my hope, which is, you know, explains some of my uh, optimism is that women would continue to have voice and that as women take leadership positions across the continent, that we will see an improvement of political leadership on that continent. The last um, two opportunities that I see for Africa have to do with its mineral resources. 
And I often say that Africa is not a poor continent. It's unfortunately the poor management of our resources that make Africa come across as a poor continent. The continent has got some of the greatest reserves in minerals, reserves in the equatorial forest that will have definitely a say in the global debate on climate change. And the continent has got so much to offer the globe that were these assets to be properly harnessed, that Africa would have its rightful seat at the table. Let me just conclude by talking about the role of technology and how the combination of the youthful bar that I talked about, this younger generation of Africans who see themselves as citizens of the world, who are tech savvy, how that combination of youth, activism, uh, activism from women and youth, knowledge of technology can make a difference in helping Africa live from all of the developmental challenges that the continent has faced. My hope is that as the continent moves forward, that this new younger generation would be able to use its communication skills to advocate for African citizens, to advocate for good and accountable governance, and to play a substantial role in making sure that the cont continent can consolidate some of its gains with regards to democratic governance, and that some of the anomalies that we still see in terms of military intervention in politics, in terms of autocratic rule, can be overridden by the resilience that we see in terms of the Africans' commitment and attachment to democratic governance. I would like to stop here for my opening remarks and give an opportunity for your questions so I we can delve into more details on the issues that you care the most about. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Fomonio. Um, th that was fascinating. I think I took about five pages of notes. So um, I think I'm going to start off the questions with thinking about the positives that you talked about, the youth gold. How is it that you, the different groups that you're working with, particularly those ground grassroots groups that are trying to develop, how do you go about helping young people engage in democratic um, activities when in fact, maybe in their country, there haven't been models or examples of that before? That's an excellent question. And thank you, Dr. Zacharias, uh, for, for that question. Um, when I first started at NDI, I've been with the organization for over 25 years. The democratic transitions that I referred to that were occurring in the early 90s, in the early 1990s, were in the early stages. And so it was difficult to find uh, people on the continent who could also amplify the message of organizations such as NDI. Uh, unfortunately, three decades later, we now see that the, the advocacy for democratic governance is African owned, and that in many of these countries, even when you have autocratic regimes, they get called out by their own citizens. Whereas, you know, uh, three or four decades ago, that wasn't the case. The autocrats served, they were viewed as presidents for life. Nobody questioned how they governed. What we see today is a very vibrant civil society that stands up uh, to, to autocratic leaders. And so organizations such as NDI come to them as partners to stand behind them and lend them the support that they need to be able to accomplish the missions that they've set up for themselves. And we do that by engaging in genuine partnerships where we provide technical assistance in terms of training, where we provide opportunities for them to interact with their peers from other countries from on the continent or other countries outside of the continent, where we share with them lessons learned from other countries that have gone through similar transitions. For example, you mentioned elections in, in, in your introduction. Election monitoring, getting citizens to come out and monitor their elections wasn't a prevalent practice on the African continent until this third wave of democratization began. And NDI took the lead in many countries in advocating for citizens of 
those countries to be allowed to be accredited to monitor their own election. And that's how the concept of citizen observation or domestic monitoring became a, a norm in many of the African countries. And so when you have elections nowadays, you don't only have the international delegations that come in to monitor the elections, you have tons and tons of citizen observation groups that are accredited by the election commission to also monitor their elections. And they go out and they monitor elections and they also write out their own reports that are equally powerful and as substantive as reports written by other international organizations. We, we then have what we now see in countries such as South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, even in Ethiopia, while the crisis is still ongoing, we now have citizens being trained in the thousands on how to monitor the performance of the election commission, how to watch the polls, how to report on irregularities. And on election day, these thousands of citizens get scattered around the country to do that. And that enhances the credibility and the transparency of the electoral process. All too often, what we have seen at NDI is that when citizens engage in these kinds of civic responsibility, they become so sensitized on their roles and responsibilities as citizens that by the time the next elections come, many of them want to run for public office. And by the time they get elected into public office, they want to perform according to the norms that they had imbibed when they were ordinary citizen activists. And that contributes to the, the growing pool of committed Democrats that we see on the African continent. Today, as Ethiopia prepares for its elections, the people who are in Ethiopia training other, training Ethiopians to monitor the polls are from Nigeria, are from Ghana, are from Tanzania, Malawi, other African countries that went through that experience. And so that is the approach that NDI has taken to make sure that we are seen and we see ourselves as part of this collective group of committed Democrats, small d Democrats around the world that are working to make democracy thrive and that are working to make the world a better place. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. We do have another question. Um, how has the status of democracy on the African continent helped or impeded the response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has had its toll on the African continent as well. Uh, the positive news is that some of the projections, some of the dire projections that have been made early on in 2020 about the potential impact on Africa, projections that were based on the lack of solid inf healthcare infrastructure to be able to withstand the demands of the COVID pandemic, uh, that some of those projections did not pan out. Fortunately, the continent still recorded its deaths and its hospitalizations. Uh, the continent is now struggling to catch up with vaccinations and to make them accessible to people uh, across the country, not just in the capital cities or in the big cities, but also in the rural areas that are impacted. Uh, the economies of the continent have suffered because of the general freeze on travel that we experienced in 2020 and in the early part of this year. Uh, and the growth rates that many African countries were beginning to record up until 2019 have really shrunk because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's also true that many governments have had to shift their investments from the public sector, such as on issues of education or even on institutions that could help consolidate democracy to put them into the healthcare sector. And that has you know, created an imbalance in their budgeting. Uh, I am very concerned that even going forward, uh, issues of debt relief for Africa um, are going to come up because a lot of these countries have incurred additional debt uh, in trying to deal with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And because their economies haven't done well during this period, they have been unable to service their debt. And so I can see that issue come up. We also saw within the political governance arena that because of the restrictions that were in place and which some authoritarian regimes 
interpreted to their benefit, they use the pretext of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic to make it extremely difficult for political opposition parties to be able to mobilize themselves, for parliaments to cede and exercise the proper oversight, or for citizens to advocate with their elected officials um, for an improvement in policies and in, in governance. And so on balance, I would say that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a negative effect. We also saw governments such as in Uganda, for example, enact legislation that banned gatherings because Uganda was going into an election year. That ban was enforced when it came to opposition candidates and parties, but it wasn't enforced when the ruling party wanted to organize its gathering. And so that kind of imbalance uh, was problematic. We saw that in Ethiopia, for example, coming under the, the, the heavy burden of managing the pandemic that the government decided to postpone the elections in Ethiopia, but the postponement was done without consultations with all of the pol political parties involved, including the leaders of one of the main parties in the Tigray region of the country. And so these leaders, took offense with the postponement and decided they would organize their own elections without the control of the federal government. And that's what led to the beginning of the conflict that eventually morphed into a civil war that has left thousands of people dead and horrible gross human rights violations in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. And so we can look at what the continent has gone through and see that the COVID-19 pandemic was very problematic for the continent. We didn't have the deaths that we anticipated, fortunately, uh, but it's left its mark. And I think that the continent will take a long time to fully recover from this, both politically and with regards to economic uh, development and opportunities for investors. Do you fear if, if you look at this, um, the, you mentioned external interferences, particularly from countries like Russia and China, now um, both of whom have a vaccine, um, that they will use this as an additional entree into Africa to say, we can provide you with vaccines if you, you know, kind of a quid pro quo, we will work with you because the Western countries have left you behind, um, with vaccines, with really pushing out, providing a more internationalist approach um, because they can't manage their own to some extent. And so do you fear that this is another place of entry from, from a Russia or China? I mean, your observation and, and question are both very pertinent uh, because I think these illiberal forces um, have been very adroit in navigating their way uh, to get a seat at the table um, and to continue to reinforce their own narrative. Um, in the case of Africa, uh, the relationship between Africa and Europe, uh, because that's where the former colonial powers were, uh, obviously it's been a very rocky relationship. And I think that these illiberal forces have taken advantage of that in a number of countries. For example, in Mali, we saw that when the military staged a coup in Mali, uh, that we had young people in the streets waving the Russian flag and pulling down the French flag. Um, of course, they had grievances in terms of the relationship with, with France, uh, but that was one opportunity that the Russians used to say, you know, the people love us. We also see uh, similar developments in the Central African Republic, uh, where the Russians have now established a base and they're, they're helping provide security to the country, but they're also providing this security through irregular forces, uh, contractors, Russian contractors, and at the same time, making deals with the country to have access to the country's diamonds. It's a country that produces uh, diamonds and other raw minerals. The fact that Europe has been slow in coming up with its own vaccines has aggravated the issue and has opened up that opportunity even wider uh, because very early on we had China and Russia providing vaccines to countries such as Guinea, Conakry and a number of other countries on the continent. 
And so they have definitely taken advantage of that. I am very pleased that the current US administration has been very supportive of the COVAX mechanism, which is this platform that has been put together by international partners to make sure that African countries and other countries in the developing world can have access to vaccine. I think that's one way of norming that false argument that the illiberal forces have used. Uh, and my hope is that it would provide an opportunity to have a more transparent conversation about access to healthcare and the support that African countries also receive from Western uh, countries and partners. Somebody has asked, we do have a question about colonialism and you just mentioned the obviously long colonial relationship, um, um, oppression ship between, between the African continent and Europe. Um, how much are there still controls of distribution of, you know, economic access to banking that run that same kind of colonial route, if you will? That's an excellent question. And uh, if I were to hazard a guess, I would say that uh, the question has definitely come from someone who is an expert in Francophone Africa. Uh, because that remains a thorny issue uh, in the 14 countries that were former French colonies on the African continent. Uh, these 14 countries still have a currency that was pegged to the French franc and is now pegged to the euro through the French treasury. Uh, they have accounts of their foreign reserves in the French treasury and access to this foreign reserve determined by the French. And that's a very sour point, especially for the younger generation of Africans, for that youthful restive category of Africans who didn't live through the colonial era and who cannot understand why their own government cannot determine the economic and fiscal policies of their countries without having influence from the French treasury or from the French pres uh, presidency. And I think this is really a legacy of the colonial era. And some political scientists have written about neocolonialism, which captures the fact that even though all or many African countries had independence, uh, had their freedoms and their sovereignty at independence, that there's still this nebulous sometimes some will say insistious, economic and financial ties that make it extremely difficult for these African countries to survive and make decisions on their own. They make it extremely difficult, for example, for these African countries to even form broader unions with other neighboring African countries without seeking the approval or without fearing the possibility of offending the previous colonial power. And the reason I say this is linked to the colonial trends is that if we go back to pre-1960 or pre-1957, when the first African country, Ghana, had its independence in 1957, and then followed by Guinea Conakry in 1958, the British mode of colonial rule was indirect rule. And so they let the African traditional entities survive and the British were mostly interested in trade relationship, in preserving their commercial interests. But on issues of governance, they allowed the local authorities and the traditional chiefs to run their kingdoms and their territories as they saw fit. On the contrary, on the other hand, the French took the approach of direct rule, where you had French governors appointed by Paris to be governors in the territories. And the French even created a two-tier system in their colonies where the educated natives were given more powers and more rights than the uneducated un un natives. And many of these educated natives or elites were taken to Paris and saw themselves serving in French institutions such as parliaments and governments, even though they were African. And my sense is that despite independence, 
these two trends continue to project themselves on the African continent. And so when you see a country like Botswana or Ghana or even Sierra Leone, former British colonies, Nigeria, you see a lot more autonomy in terms of how the leaders make their own decisions. When you go to French speaking countries such as Senegal, Cameroon, Congo Brazzaville, Chad, Mali, you see that even when leaders are called upon to make decisions, there's always a time during which they try to consult with Paris. Or as soon as they make the decision, people wait 48 hours or 24 hours to hear what Paris says about the decision that was made by an African head of state. And I think that robs many Africans the wrong way, and especially the younger generation of Africans who really want to take in their own hands, their own destiny and the ability to impact on the politics of their respective countries. How do you see women fitting into the young women, young African women who are increasingly educated. As you said, in Sudan, we saw this real movement of women who made such a shift. We saw it in Sierra Leone and some other places where women said enough is enough. Um, how do you see the young um, women, education of young women as part of this kind of youth bulge movement of really expecting something different? I would say that the, the, the potential is there. And if there were, if I had a recommendation to make to a policymaker or a philanthropist, I would say, if you want to invest in Africa of the future, in fact, I'd say Africa of the present and the future, because we don't want to keep shifting that future, it's investing in African women because they can move things. They can move countries. Liberia, for example, going back to Liberia and Sierra Leone, you mentioned the women of Sierra Leone. They formed a 50-50 movement, which they call 50-50, um, because they wanted to see more women at the seat of the table. Because in the heat of civil war in these two countries, it was the women who organized themselves to go in the bushes and find the warlocks and speak to them as mothers to say, you have to drop your weapons and come to the negotiation table. Unfortunately, when the warlords dropped their weapons and came to the negotiation table, people did not keep the seats that the women had earned, give them the right to get into those seats. And so as you move across the continent, you see professional women, experienced women, very successful in academia, in banking, in business, but they don't have the access that's required to influence policy. And that's where the continent is lagging behind. I'm really impressed that more and more women are coming forward to run for public office. Um, as president, uh, more and more women are getting nominated or appointed as prime ministers and cabinet ministers. And in a number of African countries, we have seen laws being put in place to demand quotas. And there may be philosophical arguments for some people about quarters or no quarters, but there's a recognition that unless you find some legal instruments to break the log jam, the, the power play on the continent is so stashed against women in terms of mobilizing resources, access to capital, and, and the ability to go out and, and campaign or conduct politics the way it's currently being conducted in the transition states or in countries that are still under autocratic rule, that you couldn't just trust women out there without providing a legal framework that would make it easier for them to be able to access power. And we see that in countries such as Rwanda, in countries such as Senegal, where those quotas were put in place, you now have almost a 50-50 representation of women in parliament. Almost a 50-50 representation of women in parliament in Rwanda. In fact, Rwanda has the, the best track record in the world in terms of women's engagement in politics and representation in parliament. Senegal has a very high percentage of women in parliament and in local councils. And it's these women serving in local councils as mayors, as councillors, women serving in parliament, who tomorrow will fill presidential candidates and will be able to run their countries. That's why every time a woman comes out 
the president either through the ballot box, as was the case in Liberia, or through succession with respect for the constitution, as was the case in Malawi and now in Tanzania, we all root for them because we hope and we trust that that's really where the hope lies for the African continent of the future. You can only see the few women who've gone out um, of the continent. W, the WT, uh, w World Trade Organization just had its first woman director general of WTO and she's African. And I bet you she's going to perform just as elegantly and as professionally and as effectively as any other director general that the World Trade Organization has had. That's, that's so exciting. Um, I, uh, on a less probably exciting note, and as we're kind of moving down, but you did talk about um, the security issues. Um, and one of the questions that I had um, is American policy, not as much related to specifically the continent of Sub-Saharan Africa, but how the choices that were made, say, during the Arab Spring, if you think about Libya, and how that, the choices made there sent potentially a flood of guns and other things into Central African Republic and Mali, and how this is impacted downward, you know, how is, what is that relationship as you look at American foreign policy in, in, the, in that kind of 2011, 2012, and what are the impacts then in some of these countries that we're seeing some increasing destabilization in? I mean, you, you, you're so right. You're so, you're so right, uh, Karen Beth, because the destabilization of Libya uh, by the way in which Gaddafi left power really opened the Pandora's box and has contributed exponentially to the proliferation of light weapons, arms and light weapons across most of the continent. Um, because people have to remember that um, between Libya and Northern Africa and the rest of the continent, that's only a desert. Uh, the beauty of the desert is nobody lives there, but the the downside is that everybody can go across the desert. And so we had arms that left Libya into Northern Mali that empowered groups that were in Northern Mali. We had people um, that left Libya and found their ways into Northern Niger and eventually into Chad. Uh, we know that once every 10 years, Chad has had a military crisis in which thousands of people have been killed and rebel movements have left from Southern Libya to find their way into Chad. And I think that was a teaching moment, um, which in some ways um, could be very paralyzing for policymakers. And I hope that you know, every time that policymakers think about Libya, it shouldn't be, let's never do anything on the African continent with regards to an autocratic, an autocrat or a, a, a dictatorial regime but more, what can we do better that wasn't done in helping the Libyans go through their transition? Um, because autocrats or autocratic regimes on the continent are very good in selling the false narrative that as long as they are in power, you have the stability that you need, everything is stable. And if you try to ask me to create space for citizens to have a say in how I govern, for citizens to be able to have meaningful elections, then you can destabilize the situation. And if I fall, then you wouldn't have the ally that you need. Uh, but that argument was what Africa went through when we had the likes of the Idi Amin's in Uganda, or we had uh, Mumbutu Seseko, Seko in Zaire. Uh, but at the end of the day, we realized that these autocrats while they were stable for themselves and their close family, uh, left a country that was ungovernable once they left. And for me, that's a mark of failure, not a mark of their success. And so I hope that policymakers can look at Libya uh, and say, what can we do to correct some of the mistakes of the past? And how can we deal with these African countries that are now being fragilized because of the collapse of Libya, notably in the Sahel, but also in the Horn of Africa, how can we help them stabilize 
How can we help them go through security sector reform? How can we make sure the state is effective? Because some of this destabilization comes about certainly from external factors, but there are also internal factors where people have become so disaffected from this, the state, where people live in ungoverned spaces and where youth become susceptible to being recruited in some of these movements because they don't identify with the state because they don't see the state delivering public services that would make them feel that their lives are better on being on the side of the state as opposed to being allied with forces that can further destabilize the state. Thank you so much, Christopher. This has just been wonderful. Thank you so much for your insights and for telling us actually some great news about Africa and a lot more work that we have to do. So thank you very much. And well, uh, Matthew, thank I'm you so much for giving me the opportunity indeed. Oh, it's this is fascinating. Matthew, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, Dr. Fomonio and, and, and Dr. Zacharias, thank you so much for uh, an incredible conversation uh, that offered such detailed uh, insight and perspective on what's happening on the African continent. Um, it's a place of a lot of complexity, a lot of nuance. Uh, Chris is, as you pointed out, very well tonight. Um, and it's a place that we in Kansas City really need to get to understand uh, better and more fully. And so thank you for helping us take steps in that direction with this conversation. Uh, Chris, you're welcome back anytime. We can't wait to have you out in, in Kansas City, um, along with your other colleagues from NDI. Uh, and and to, uh, to Dr. Uh, Zacharias, Karen Beth, thank you for uh, for leading us through uh, this, this really incredible discussion. Uh, to all of you at home and work and wherever you are, thank you for joining us at the International Relations Council for this conversation. We hope you'll join us for other conversations in the weeks ahead. Do check us out online at irckc.org where you can find our events calendar as well as how to become a member. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.